Hi, I'm John Hinkle, Netgear's Pro AV Product Marketing Manager. I'm here with my friend Alex Pendleton, our Senior Systems Engineer, and we're gonna to talk to you today about one of our awesome case studies for the American Dream. Now, Alex can take us through some of the particulars, but we're gonna set up the stage a little bit and talk about this project. It was a huge mall, a retail complex. I think you can't just categorize it that simply in New Jersey. And it really takes the entertainment, dining, retail, all these things to a whole new level. Uh, underpinned, as it says, by an interactive and immersive AV experience with hundreds of digital signage applications, video walls. It's really set to become one of the biggest uh, visitor experiences in North America. Uh, it really, as they describe it, is a feast for the senses. Uh, and it has uh, LED walls, digital signage kiosks, all the stuff throughout the, the mall. You can see the layout there. It's, it's huge. Um, this all comes together with our partners, uh, one of which is SNA Display. So after providing LED display technology for the Olympic Games in Beijing in 2008, and the construction of more manufacturing space, Sansi North America, SNA, was established in New York in 2009. Now, SNA Displays has become well known in the LED display industry as the company that manufactures and installs some of the world's largest LED spectaculars. We call them mega spectacular displays. And some of these include that massive 107 foot video wall at Salesforce in San Francisco. That's got a lot of press with some fantastic content on there. Another partner of ours in this uh, extravaganza was Aurora Multimedia. Now their products incorporate state-of-the-art technologies that surpass typical specifications and features. Their history of innovation from the introduction of the industry's first non-proprietary web standards-based IP control systems and touch panels to today's advanced HD-based T and IP-based T IP video distribution has made them a dominant force in the AV industry. So that's some of the project overview. Some of the challenges to the project like this was just the huge scale that dictated AV over IP should be used uh, with, again, uh, the massive scale of this main, meant no downtime or latency was tolerated. And what SNA Displays was looking for was a partner for before the install, you know, trying to spec everything out uh, during the install and certainly after it to maintain it. And that's where Netgear came into service with our amazing Pro AV engineering services team that offers free network design for Pro AV projects of any size. And it's a worldwide team. As you can see, we have people scattered across the entire world to help access the resources when you need them. And we're gonna give you trained professionals who've seen hundreds of these installs uh, before so they can help with this process. And we're gonna talk about that process today. And it all starts with an email sent to Pro AV Design at netgear.com. Okay, Alex, so let's talk about the actual process. So this first one, right, it's like right here, uh, from October 2019 is when this process started. And you got an email from Paul Harris at Aurora Multimedia. Yeah, I, it, it was sent to uh, it was sent to Randy. Randy forwarded on to us, um, and uh, the design team took it, and we uh, we we began with our first design um, uh, based on the requirements uh, to set up a non-blocking uh, 280 by 280 uh, original uh, uh, setup, utilizing the M4396X. Exactly. So that was a go-to for us. That's one of our um, wonderful M4300 flagship. Flag flagship, which yep. is exactly. Uh, and that worked for some of the initial requests, the non-blocking requests, um, but you had to change it up a little bit. Yeah, we knew we were, need, we were going to need to get bigger um, because of the non-blocking design, uh, the amount of endpoints that uh, changed, <laughs> which in Pro AV, the the non constant or the constant is uh, is change, right? There's always an addition to, uh, or can we get away with? That I, I get that one a lot, um, you know, in the network. Uh, so to design that, uh, the original design did not cover those uh, features, and so we went back and forth a couple times uh, with a with a you know a design here, design there. We changed to the from the M4396X to the M4548X F8C. Uh, which gave us a 100 gig uplink uh, to the core, um, and uh, that that allowed us to start to really kind of building this thing out. And talk about a little bit of the non-blocking part. So as the graphic kind of here illustrates, you need everything everything to go everywhere. So it doesn't matter where it starts; it's got to go to somewhere else on a different switch, different part of the uh, huge American Dream project. And that was a that was a big deal. 
Yeah, we want when you're talking non-blocking specifically, um, you're really stating that you want to send any transmission to any receive at any any given time, like, and you should not have any limitations to that. Uh, and you know, Netgear uh, is specific about priding itself on the capability of our switching uh, to allow for that type of environment. And the other part of the 4500s that was key, of course, was the huge 100 gig uplinks it has. That's right. And it, it's a step up from the M4396 and overall capabilities. Um, it's, just a, it's just the next level, if you will. The 96X is great for the addition for what it is, uh, but it, at 40 gigs, it just didn't have enough horsepower from a bandwidth perspective. Um, getting it to that 100 gig link, we knew uh, that that was going to satisfy the edge requirement. And part of that change happened with the more endpoints that you received the requirement for up to 640. I mean, that's massive. That's it's a huge scale of design. Now it comes into a numbers game, right? I mean, you need more ports. Um, the larger the requirement, the amount of ports you're going to need uh, because the bandwidth going around is just going to be uh, uh, too slim to really bring that uh, forward. Um, and you run out of ports at the core. And so uh, we needed to come up with a solution and add more switches to the core. So the 4500 worked really well for that. And I know um, from what you told me too, that the difference of this one is that with the Aurora endpoints, they're actually transceivers. So they can be transmit or receive at any time. And we yeah, they actually, uh, they actually have a USB port connected to it for the source. And, and uh, at any given moment through the software, you can flip that and change that trans that receiver originating as a re transmitter. Um, so that gives us a unique complexity of, of uh, going in the opposite direction of uh, the receipt or the original transmit or the original receive. So uh, with that being the case, you know, originally, you know, it's either one flow or the other, uh, you know, the handle, handle the transmit on the same switch in some cases, but with this, it's, that entire switch could at some point change to be uh, a, uh, a, a, you know, transmitter or receive. So we needed to have a more uh, robust and redundant solution that would provide a, a almost a, a two opposite directions of traffic flow. Um, and uh, that solution, um, as, as we got down to it, uh, you know, became a, a multi-chassis link aggregation. So then no question for the M4500s. Now, before we get into some of the MLAG stuff coming up, I know that um, as you started looking at you, you realized we need a whole lot more bandwidth at the core. Uh, actually, significantly more, I think, was your actual word. So right. it yeah. just up the ante. Yeah, it just, it, and it's line rate. I mean, if you have your own set switch, you can, and you don't, and the traffic's going in one direction, you can keep everything um, uh, kind of tight and utilize the backplane, which has a great, great way of, of, uh, of load balancing all of that bandwidth. And with the M4500s, I mean, they've got plenty of backplane bandwidth. Um, when you're, when you're running out of ports though, and, and you need more switches to load balance all of the endpoints, uh, you've got to come up with a line rate solution. Um, and that's, that's where the significantly more bandwidth comes in. That's where MLAG comes in. And that's our solution then. So once you found out that MLAG was there, let's talk a little bit about MLAG and, and what it is really. Sure. So as essentially, it's a mirror of what is happening from a control message perspective uh, from switch to switch. So uh, core one on the left and the core A on the right there in the diagram um, show uh, control messages going back and forth as they happen in real time. And they utilize, and to do this, they utilize what they call a peer link. So as the event takes place, uh, whether it be, you know, ARP message of a new device or whether it be, a, you know, an IGMP message of a new route for multicast, uh, it syncs that directly with its peer. Um, now there's, there's uh, uh, you know, the, uh, there's a single tier, which is what you see there, and then there's a double tier as well, um, which will also complete this type of, uh, of environment. I think we show some of that on a diagram coming up as well later on. But so yeah. MLAG, but MLAG is not just a simple little switch. You have to check a box or something. There's a lot of programming or some yeah. effort involved. 
making yeah. this happen. Yeah, you need to, yeah, you have to identify your peers and you, you have to identify the local links um, because those also have to support MLAG. Uh, but the peer link also needs to, to know that it can flood uh, video traffic. Um, you know, you need to be able to utilize that as an additional bandwidth link uh, between the cores. So that was another thing. Can't just be for control messages. So now you figured out MLAG's the deal. Then you got to go back to your uh, final design. To the original and, design, uh, yeah. Incorporate that. So what we have here is that final design for the American Dream Project with 640 endpoints. Crazy amount. Yeah. So, um, and this is, it, it's going to look kind of, uh, kind of nice you know it's like a, a nice kind of flow to it but um the design uh that originally we put together uh didn't work we came up with a four core m lag with two peer links this is the double tier um and then you crisscross the local links and then also have a north and south direct link um which is very which is important because of the uh of the communication paths that you can take with MLAG, it syncs the, the and spanning tree, it, it syncs those paths uniquely um, uh, into the system. So now you have multiple ways of getting to the same endpoint. Um, and because the, the IGMP routes are being shared between the switches um, and flooded all around the network, now we have a unique path and we can still flood at our optimal flood of layer two which is, is the very more, uh, very important thing. I, I call the four cores after the best uh, football division in, in the NFL, uh, the NFC North, Packers, Bears, Lions, and Vikings. I love it. And that's, that's just an easy way to remember it and to make it, you know, make it fun too a little bit because there's a lot yeah. of work involved in this, I realize. Yeah. It's not a simple one. Cool. So then you got the final, final design figured out and now uh, we start having more meetings and start getting things underway here. And this is March 6th of 2020. Uh, you had the first meeting with the player. So here's Stu Ives, the senior director of SNA Displays. We got Paul Harris, the CEO of Aurora Multimedia. Yourself involved, senior systems engineer. And also from Netgear, Randy Keener, the director of strategic accounts. So all of you have been working this project. And now you got to figure out how to get this to happen. Right. And they're starting to step up their time frame. And this is all beginning over a weekend. Uh, one of the things I think I loved about this uh, when you told me about this project was that this was done in your lab back in San Jose where you configured everything and, and built that up. So talk about some of that, how you can replicate the entire system or figure it out on paper and then simply configure it in your lab and ship it off. Yeah, and, and to credit to the Stu and, uh, and Paul Harris, um, you know, they're, they're consummate professionals. Um, and we, we were able to just go right through a very productive meeting. This is what we want to do. This is how we're going to do it. Um, everyone agreed. Um, it, was, uh, it was just a very uh, top-notch meeting, I, and all of the timelines were fitting together. Um, I, I planned, I had a M4500, a 32C in my lab, um, so I built the, the MLAG configuration and the core configuration on that switch in my lab. Um, and just went down through all the ports and all of the, the configurations, fine-tuned everything, made it work for what they were going to do, uh, created all the different uh, configuration files. Um, and then I worked on the, the, the edge switch independently um, uh, because it has its own firmware. It has its own thing. It's 48 SFP ports, so we needed to make sure that everything was configured for that as well. Um, and then uh, and get the uplinks coming back to the core, so that was that was important. Um, and and then once those were built, I I put them in a nice little package on a Saturday, sent them over to Stu, and uh, and he was ready to go with the instructions on how to install that. Um, and of course, I made myself available for for the whole time that they would be on the ground. Um, and uh, and yeah, so that went really really well. The good thing is initially, right, everything seemed to be working just great. Right. Yeah. Um, we were we were cruising right along. I checked in um, a couple times, like on the Monday and Tuesday. Uh, things were going right along. Um, they had a couple questions about um, the the physical configurations of uh, the ports, um, but uh, we ironed those out, and that was everything was going really well. Um, and then uh, at at a at a juncture, some point on Wednesday. 
uh, they found one issue where they would go ahead and um, configure one route and then can go to configure another route and send that video, flip the video, because the, they only had the one source to really, that really needed to be tested at that time. Um, they would flip it to a different receiver and it would drop the whole, the whole receiver. So that we figured out, uh, we had to do a lot of troubleshooting, but it was definitely something that we, we uh, uh, knew kind of what the problem was. It took a little bit of troubleshooting, um, but we found out that that uh, was one of those uh, unique problems uh, that we needed to look at. Um, Another one came up, right? Second issue came up. Yeah, the second issue, uh, along with that issue, while troubleshooting that issue, uh, we found out that there was definitely something uh, spur spurious about the MLAG itself. It was not producing the routes correctly um, and and seemingly didn't have anything to do with bandwidth, which was even more of a of a of a caution flag because if it if it wasn't bandwidth related, uh, then what is actually the the issue? What are the what are the problems that we would see there? Um, so and we this is, yeah good sorry a good, a good point I'm sorry about troubleshooting I think which is key is that you guys have done enough of these before and you know how to troubleshoot this stuff so you could bring everything down like okay disconnect everything except for just what you need to try to isolate what the problem is and that was critical to finding out the uh, solution yeah we we knew it was traversing the M lag um, because the the uh, the switch to switch stuff worked fine but the stuff going across the M lag it seemed to have some kind of like it would work in some cases and wouldn't work in others. So it was really one of those uh, oh no moments because what what are we dealing with here? Um, and that started like around yeah you know, I mean you know Stu Stu likes to to paint the picture a little differently because you know it uh, it, it seemed like a full 24 hours but he he let me sleep at some point you know I mean it was it was tough but it was uh, it was around the clock work that we did um i involved engineering immediately um and we we went to ground on what exactly this issue could possibly be um and uh, it was tough it, it was really tough to to get to that uh, uh solution i know you you felt the pain and i can hear it in the way you tell the story too that you know you wanted to be there of course and normally you guys would be there for some of these installations yeah brutally um as this was happening the world was shutting down um, and, uh, you know, I, I can't, I, I laugh, I smirk a little bit because it's, it was so bad. I mean, Sue's like, you said you would be here. And I, and I said, I know I would normally be there. I would get on a plane. I'd book a hotel. We would figure this out together. Um, mm -hmm. but the, the world was shutting down and we didn't understand the threat. Like a lot of, a lot of the information was being thrown around on how long it would take to, you know, we had, we had, um, uh, uh you know, people saying it would be gone by April, you know, it, that it wasn't even a real thing. It, there was a lot of things happening and it was hard to stay focused. And I just, I pleaded with Stu. I said, Hey, just let me work on this remotely with you. I promise you, we will figure this out. Um, and we will, we will get this sorted. And, uh, we started working together remotely. Uh, and he, he let us, he let us do it. And he, and, and to his credit, he stayed on the ground with us and hung in there while we figured it out. And cause they're sitting there kind of to say, a, use a phrase, kind of dead in the water, right? They're just kind right. of waiting for the stuff to be fixed. Yeah. They have, so, they have some stuff up and some stuff down and that's not okay in, in AV. We need everything yep. up. Yep. So let's talk about some of the issues and how you kind of got to that place of figuring them out. So the first one where the video would drop, right? you figured that one out. Yeah. I, 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 was I was able to see that on the core, when we would originate with the, the specific source that was being sent to the specific receiver, I, I would see that drop. And that was very apparent at that point that the lag link itself was being dropped. So, um, so the lead was being processed in two places, once on the edge switch and once on the core. Uh, disabling fast leave auto assignment on the core, uh, which is standard operation now, uh, was the key. Now we've we've enhanced our switches again. We've actually fixed this in firmware to where the auto uh, auto assignment will automatically shut off uh, when it detects that it has an edge that has an actual device on the edge. Um, so once it sees that auto that link will be shut off or will be removed from the fast leave auto assignment uh, setup. 
it'll still remain right. on the core because you still have devices on the core potentially, yeah. And that's it's a good thing to point out about this Pro AV engineering services team is that you guys find issues in the field perhaps and come back and fix them. We have engineering involved so that nobody else has to go through this again. And that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we've created a we created an issue to resolve that, um, and it I mean it, it, it to get it into all of our switches it took about two to three months, right? As like, but what we did for this it, we just disabled it, and that solved this scenario on the ground. Yep. So then let's talk about the second issue. Oh. You had the IGP IGMP control messages yeah. failing. Much and this different was not issue. Quite easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, essentially this one was uh, was pretty brutal. Um, but once we got all the all the uh, hats on the call and we were able to go through some of the uh, the, the uh, debugging parameters that needed to be there, we looked for the specific, we had isolated down to all the parts of, P, of um, all of the uh, receivers apart, only had one TX to one RX. And we, uh, once that isolation was there, we followed that route all throughout the MLAG routes, okay? And we found that the IGMP control message was not going past the peer link. It would be sent to the local link and to the, all the other uh, switches in the MLAG, but for some reason, the origin uh, switch would not send it across the peer link. Uh, hmm. Upon this discovery, uh, engineering knew immediately what the problem was. It was, it was almost like an aha moment, right? Uh, and they, they knew what to do, and they, uh, they began working on a firmware. And when we asked for the ETA, they said 24 hours. And we asked full regression testing, and they said, yeah, we will fully regression test. Uh, and they used a, a third-party company to fully regression test the, the firmware, and they went back through all the settings, which the M4500 is a behemoth of features, okay? It has so many things that could go wrong. And the firmware they produced in that 24-hour period, I installed on the 4500-32C and the M4500-48X, and it worked. It solved that problem. I've never seen a company come together that quickly to fix a firmware uh, within that time frame ever. Uh, if this was any other company, you can go down on the list of names um, they'll put you in a three month or quarterly patch schedule. And, uh, you know, that's, that's that, you know, they won't, they won't produce anything like this. I think the beauty of Netgear, you know, we talk about it internally, you know, as being kind of a startup because we're that reactive, I think, which is great. Yeah. And that's a really important thing for our customers. Certainly as we have turned our attention to pro AV, we're able to react and understand and figure this stuff out, which is really important. So, okay. You got the fix 24 hours, amazing turnaround time. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, stress there, I know for sure. But then you got to go back, and once you have the the configuration, the solution, you got to go back to every device and update and reboot them. Yes, yeah, and I, you know, that's a credit to Stu. Really, he, he I, I made a recommendation that we utilize all the out of band ports. We set up a network there, so it was really easy to access all the switches. And um, and he was very adept at doing that. Gave you know, he provided us the access needed. To really get in there and, and fix the issue, um, if if it wouldn't have been for his diligence on the ground, it would have been very difficult to work remotely uh, during this COVID madness that was going on. So okay, so we have the all the issues resolved, and the verdict was, did it work or not? And now you got to wait, you know, for a certain number of time till they get everything booted up and rebooted, updated firmware and everything before you realize that, hey. It actually was a success, and, and yeah, that must have yeah. been an amazing feeling. To see, to see the, the Aurora IPX manager go green on all of those connections was such a beautiful, wonderful thing. I, uh, I, I can't even tell you. I mean, scrolling, it's a big, long list, right? It's all these routes. They're on the right-hand side, and, and going through it, just seeing all those connections and hearing them, you know, oh, gosh, oh, God, yes. Thank you. You know, it's just it's just Yay. a good moment. Um, so all these many hours spent, first of all, designing the system and then troubleshooting it and installing it. And we had some issues along the way and teams were up all night resolving those things. And it finally worked. Uh, that really must have been a great feeling. I think that's fantastic. So, Alex, if you look back on, on this job a little bit, the American Dream Project, it's massive, I realize. 
there's a lot of benefits from this for even the smaller projects. Um, and I think based on what you've told us today and other conversations we've had, this really helped Netgear understand early on somewhat in our commitment to the pro AV industry. We've been doing some work for a couple of years, but this project was one of those massive ones that really helped us figure out how these networks are configured at this level and supported. And that's the other key part is that you really helped bring that support in and, and not just design it and we're done, you're on your own and just call tech support if you wanted it, but you really helped uh, figure out what the issues were so you could work with them and be part of that whole project. And that I think really helps demonstrate uh, Netgear's commitment to the Pro-AV community itself. Uh, you've identified that the response time, you know, with the Pro-AV engineering services team, the email address around the world, the response time is really second to none. As right. you said a second ago, I mean, other manufacturers will not be able to react like that. And that's a really big thing. Thanks to people like yourself, this talented and committed, it's not just you have all this great knowledge, but you actually want to help these guys. Uh, I think that's that's key. I mean, that desire, and it's just you're one of a team of people doing this, but yeah. um, that desire to really go in and help, roll up your sleeves and let's figure this out. And you're feeling that pain. And as you're telling the story, I'm hearing that from you, Alex. It's great. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I mean, working on bigger projects like this, it's uh, it, it and is being able to design a network that works is 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 a dream, you know. American dream. American dream. So I think it's been a great story. I, I feel your pain and the joy at making that work, and that's really great, Alex. Thank you for sharing all the stories with us. If you want to find out more about the American Dream Project, you can go to americandream.com. They have their own website. And for more about Netgear's Pro AV products and services and our commitment to the community, what we do, uh, just go to netgear.com slash pro AV. Alex, thanks so much for being here with me and I look forward to another one of these in the future. Absolutely. Thanks, John.